Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Stigma Free Society's Facebook Live event. My name is Jerry Friesen, also known as a recovering farmer. I am a stress and conflict management specialist working out of Manitoba. Because of my own journey with mental illness, I have a real passion in talking about it because it's in talking to others we can find a path forward for ourselves. You can learn more about me by visiting jerryfriesen.ca. Through this Facebook Live event, I am representing the Stigma Free Society, which is a Canadian registered charity that aims to reduce stigma of all kinds with a focus on mental health. This event is a part of their oh, sorry, Rural Mental Wellness Toolkit, an online community-based mental health program that creates access to mental health education and peer support training as well as practical and relatable resources for those living in rural and agricultural communities. You can find the toolkit at ruralmentalwellness.com. I am excited today to have the opportunity to chat with Mara. Mara, how are you? I am well today, thank you. Great, thanks for joining us. Just a quick bio on Mara. Mara Shaw is the Executive Director of the National Farmers Union. An environmental engineer by training, she was struck by the mental health impact of bringing people together to work with good food when she volunteered at Resolve in England. Mara then left engineering to run Loving Spoonful, a good food organization in Kingston, Ontario, which collaborated with addictions and mental health services to create a cooking and mental health program, Cooking Connections. Mara started the Farmer Mental Health Working Group at the National Farmers Union that is working on the systemic conditions that negatively affect farmer mental health. Wow, I think we could probably talk for two hours, Mara. I, let's not. No one wants to listen. <laughs> okay, we'll keep it a little shorter. So let's start, uh, I mean, reading just the short bio, I suspect if I read your full bio, that, that would really be intriguing to see from where you were to where you've come to. So can you start off by telling us a bit more about your background as an environmental engineer? Uh, sure, yeah. I, I, uh, I studied chemistry uh, at University of Illinois, and I, uh, back in the way back in the 80s, thought that uh, we knew climate change was coming, and I wanted to be part of of that solution, but there wasn't such a thing as environmental engineering at the time. So um I, anyway, I created a bit of, a, of my own degree and then went off and studied that and uh, worked for the U.S. military for a well, while as a consultant for a while, cleaning up uh, military bases and then made the move to other um, cleanup operations and then finally to a nonprofit in New Jersey um, and then moved to Canada uh, with my husband back in 2000. So i um, been here ever since. Well, very interesting. But then you ended up working in agriculture. As the, as the executive director of NFU, how did that come about? I did. Um, <laughs> well, um, my parents had homesteaded, so I I don't really know farm. Like, let's be honest, that is not farming, but it's um it's close up and and uh, too close up to uh, some of the corn worms and stuff. So um anyway, I uh, um I got involved in the National Farmers Union here. They do a lot of political activity. Um, and so I was on the Food Policy Council with um, uh, with some National Farmer Union members, and we were trying to make some changes, which I'm pleased to say we've, we've made some changes. And um, so when they were looking for an executive director, I was the executive director of a really active uh, local food organization in Kingston. And I said, well, I'm not a farmer. And they said, we don't really need a farmer to run this. We need somebody who can you know, keep our cows moving from one one pasture to another pasture. And I said, well, I can do that. So um, so you will see that the experts that are, are always cited from the NFU are always our farmers. We have a farmer led organization. I'm just the one in the background keeping things going. But I've been thrilled to also be able to follow the lead of our members who wanted to see more action done on farmer mental health. And so we started up this working group. I think you've already interviewed Brooke Hayes, who's the chair of that working group. And um, so, you know, behind the scenes, there are people that are making stuff happen, too. Yeah. And you know what? That farmer mental health thing, as you well know, and I know, 
is becoming more and more of an important topic that I think we need to talk about and build awareness around. And and so just so people are aware of it, uh, I've talked about the Manitoba Farmer Wellness Program that we've got in Manitoba, and Mara was good enough to join us on the advisory committee and has been really helpful in putting that together. So I know how passionate, Mara, you are about that. Uh, so here's the question, and this is the interesting one. How do food, farming, and mental health all intersect? Oh, in so many, so many ways. Um, but what uh, I guess just what had me make the career change was um, I was not mentally well. I've not always been mentally well, and I, I had uh, a really hard patch and I had an opportunity to go to England for a year and I thought while I'm there I'm going to drop what my career and just volunteer in this wonderful um, restorative facility called Resolve where people um, come together and they they cook together and they're running a cafe and it was so interesting because people were were worried about bringing their kids into this mental health cafe. And we were more worried about the, the vulnerability of the people that were working in the cafe than of somebody's kid, right? They're wonderful people, but you just saw the, the value of having hands-on skills to work together on something. Even if you're not well, you don't have to be 100% well to be entirely valuable and part of a community, right? We act as if, okay, once you're well, then you can go and join these things. But the Great Britain just was so much further ahead than we were at the time. And that was, that was, I don't know, 10, 12, 10, 12 years ago now, caught the years fly. Yeah. So I just think that there, and you know, I look out, I'm at, um, uh, on St. Lawrence River right now, and there's an island that used to have a mental health recovery farm on it for when, when, uh, um, what back in the day, shell shocked guys came back from World War One. This everything old is new again, man. You know, this is not um, groundbreaking that it's important for people to have meaningful, cooperative, collaborative work that is recoverative. I don't know if that's a word. You're the expert on that. <laughs> but you know, so so there's there's an intersection, right? And then as we get these farmers more and more isolated and the decimation of the grain elevators and of the wheat pools and all of the ways that farmers have traditionally come together and really fought for their rights together and all of that disappearing over the last 50 years. And then we wonder why people are socially isolated. And I, I mean, that's only one reason, right? There's the whole income crisis and the climate and the everything. But as these rural communities, as we get you know, there's no one left and no one left in the church and, you know, no one left in the grain elevator. There's not even the grain elevator left. I mean, yeah, there's some upstream causes for why people aren't well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then, and then all the added stuff that happens as we carry on with life, just add to that. Yeah, absolutely. So so like you said, we had interviewed Brooke some time ago. And of course, I can't remember what I did yesterday. So I can't recall her interview at all. But can you talk a little bit more about NFU's Farmer Mental Health Working Group? Yeah, sure. We um, So the, everything that the NFU does is um, directed by our farmer members. And so they voted democratically back in 2019, I believe it was, to direct the NFU to work more on, on farmer mental health and see if we couldn't get more benefits, uh, like the ones that Deb has been working on that I'm sure you've highlighted, and the ones that you're working on in, in, uh, um, in Manitoba, right? Farmer wellness, um, but also, and also, I shouldn't say but, but and also to look at the systemic issues um, of farmer mental health and how they intersect. And um, so we started meeting about a year and a half ago, and we have some wonderful members uh, that are, um, some of them are, are therapists themselves and farmers, and some are academics. Um, some of them are not therapists, but just very compassionate people. And we're trying to figure out, I think our our next, you know, we've been connecting, uh, trying to figure out what what 
resources are out there and how many of those resources can we really push to make sure that when farmers are calling for help, that they're being heard by somebody who knows what they're talking about and understands agriculture. Because otherwise you get the answers like, well, you should just take a vacation. And, you know, that is just not possible if your dairy herd yeah. needs you every day. So um, I, one of the things that our group is now working on, I, I think the next thing to come out of that group is going to be a survey paper of the the upstream issues that are causing poor mental health. And there's been some research done, but there's, I think that it would be nice if that was a real campaign that, that really got to the heart of Health Canada and making sure that we embed this, not in, you know, uh, it's lovely that people are trying to pick things up and make them happen, but if they're embedded in a program, then you know they stick around um, or you hope they do. Yeah, you hope exactly. Uh, but the programs have to be there for them to participate in. Yes, absolutely. And we're so grateful there are people who are making that happen. Yeah. yeah. So, and and I we hear the word systemic in a lot of different areas in the news these days. But can you talk a little bit about the systemic conditions that have negative implications for farmers' mental health? Sure, absolutely. And I, I know I won't hit them all because I don't think that we even understand them all. Yeah. I mean, there there's some, um, you know, the, there is the hollowing out of our rural communities. So there are just fewer people left. Um, oh, gosh, is that can you hear that? I heard something. <laughs> got that. We've got some loud engines out there. I think that anyway, somebody. Oh, no worries. Um, so, you know, the ho hollowing out of our rural communities. Um, you know, the, the farmers are often price takers, um, less so when they organize collectively, but more so um, as um, as structures fall apart, like the wheat pool or, you know, um, you know, it's supply management, for example, you become more of a price taker. And then as input costs go up and we know all of the costs for fertilizer and fuel and all of that is skyrocketing right now. I mean, farmer mental health wasn't great to begin with, but now we're looking at, you know, um, conditions where, um, you know, it's, it is easy to lose the farm. And I will, I mean, I'm sure anybody in this field ha knows many, many people who have lost the family farm. It's not like losing a job. This is losing something that's been in the family for generations. This is how you define your entire life. And, it is gone in the, you know, in the scribbling of a one global trade agreement that undermines our, our you know, our supply management program, for example. So, uh, you know, that that's another thing. And I would say that one of the biggest challenges uh, that I run into, and you, you guys are much more expert than I am, is that you can't divorce your family. And if the whole family's on the farm and somebody wants to go this way and you want to go that way and or you can't figure out a succession plan. Um, and I mean, it can just be, the whole thing can be heartbreaking. And then there's all of the the aspects that affect everybody, right? Yeah. Just, the, um, just the effects of being human and um, challenged. Well, and, and the way I often put it, Mara, is farming when i was growing up on a farm was was so simple for my father um but nowadays like you say we've lost some of the systems that were in place that that helped simplify agriculture and now uh, what's what's happening is farmers have to make more and more and more decisions and and a one wrong decision can be a life-changing event and so there's a lot hanging on that decision and so you throw all of that together you put throw Mother Nature into the mix, and I can tell you here in Manitoba this year we've gone from three years of drought to people can't get their crop in because it's too wet, and so all of this just compiles, and each day is a new challenge. and And uh, I'm intimately aware of, and so are you, Mara, about the effects that that can have on our mental wellness. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's um. And it's it's hard to imagine someone um, 
you know, I think I think everybody who eats needs to be grateful that there are people willing to make those decisions and take those massive risks and the hard work and the um, yeah. And now, now I'm going to veer off of the questions I was going to ask you and ask you something else because you make a very good point. Because farmers make up less than 2% of the population. In fact, I saw one number that said 1% the other day, but even yeah. if it's 2%, that's such a, such a small minority. How can we get that message out better? The message about needing to farm? Yeah, the, the fact that we all need farmers. I mean, we're we're not going to eat without them, right? Right. Um, yeah, that's a very good. I, I would love it if people wanted to write into the show and tell me how to how to do that. I know, you know, we've done bumper stickers in the past. We've uh, done information, you know, handouts at uh, farmers markets. It's just a, a Canada is an interesting place because a lot of our farmers are growing for export and they're keeping our GDP going. I mean, it's a major aspect to our GDP, right? And and yet, um, you know, we need to be careful also that we're making sure that we have food sovereignty and are able to feed ourselves for when things break down in Mexico and, you know, they lose the water in the Ogallala Aquifer and, you know, in the U.S. I mean, yeah. So um, I don't, I don't know. It's interesting to see as grocery prices rise and everybody's freaking out and farmers are still not making any more. So it's not farmers that are getting any of that cut, right? That these are, uh, you know, you hear people complaining about food prices and you're thinking, but somebody's taken that whole middle and it's not, it's not the people that um, are doing the, the hard labor. So we're trying to constantly push that message um, and there's some interesting stuff on the nfu website we do a report uh we put one out last december and are relaunching it just to remind people of that gap um but that wasn't your question sorry i just i think that's super important that we don't lose the fact that you know the average person is only seeing the price of the grocery store yeah. and not realizing who's taking that part of the of the um of the income and it's not our farmers but it is um yeah that that i think there is there's the people that are lucky enough to be able to shop at their farmers market and have some local food sovereignty and then people that are either too far away or you know their income isn't sufficient or you know transportation or whatever and um it's just much trickier and yet um, we're all benefiting from the work of Canadian farmers, for sure. You know, I used to, back in the day when I was farming, I was a hog producer, and I would often, and, and we were facing some significant financial challenges because of all the market fluctuations and trade um, trade issues. And I remember often thinking, you know what, I'm raising enough product here to feed a small city, but I'm finding it difficult to feed my own family. And And the irony of that. Absolutely. Yeah. And we, I mean, there are a lot of, uh, a, a lot of the kind of smaller innovative hog producers are going to, you know, local buy direct, right. And, and, you know, in, in every, in every sector, I know I, I get all of our meat from different local producers who are doing stuff, but it's, um, it all depends. That's also geographically determined. And it's completely ridiculous, right? So there are countries with different models for how much money are you giving to the fuel sector versus supporting your agriculture and which is, where should your money be going? Yeah. You know, I'm going to I'm gonna go a little personal here, Mara, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, you said at the outset that you had hit a, hit a rough patch. Um, I often talk about, and you've heard me talk about the fact that that my mental illness started when I was farming due to a lot of the stressors going on. You are clearly very, very passionate about mental health and agriculture. Does, you, does your own personal experiences kind of play a role in that passion? Oh, I think so. I think so, for sure. And I think it, um, if I can, and I, Jerry, you're going to have to put this in context because it, 
I don't know if it's right to say, but I think the, the biggest thing that I got out of it was that we are all so challenged. And so just to be working with other people and recognizing you're not perfect, I'm not perfect. You know, in my 20s, I would have said, well, you're not perfect uh, and I'm not perfect. So we should all just go home and throw up our hands. Right. But but at some point you realize, oh, God, I'm flawed. I'm so flawed. And so are you. And so are you. And so I'm just going to work with you as you are. And I think it I hope it makes me a better person as far as, you know, being a boss and being a collaborator and just being, you know, a, a member of a number of different communities. Um, and, and certainly, I don't know, I, the, the agricultural sector, it's going to be so hard to change the conditions that make mental health a challenge, right? So grateful for people at the, at the end, you know, where people need it. And also grateful for anybody who's saying, you know, what we need is more farm supports on farms so that People like Jerry don't have to leave hog farming. People don't lose their farm to begin with, whatever. So I think, I mean, I think anybody who's gone through a mental illness and been lucky enough to come out the other side comes out a very changed person and oftentimes just a person with more insight about yeah. life is, life is, can be, can look great and be hard, right? And yeah, absolutely, and and I think that's where where again, and this is kind of twofold, is we've dealt with the stigma for years and years and years about well, uh, you know, I have a mental illness, I can't reach out. I know we're building awareness on that. Um, I you made a comment before about not being a hundred percent well. I I'm not convinced that there's very many people on this earth that are a hundred percent well how can we get that message through to others that, you know what, there, it's okay to reach out for help. Yeah. You know, the, the, um, there, there was a really neat, um, TV set of TV commercials when I was in, in England that were, um, you know, Jerry's returning to work. He's been away. We all know he's been away because he was away on depression. How do you talk to Jerry? Right. And the answer was, Hey, Jerry, how you doing? Are you feeling okay these days? I, you know, and so I'm really excited and maybe you've been following this. I would like more information on this new movement they were talking about in the Globe and Mail for um, training people on how to just be that kind of person. I don't know if you saw that article, but they said down in, I think in Boston or Baltimore, there are barber shops that have a certain sign up that says, you know, something that lets people know you can talk here and we're yeah. somewhat trained. We're not experts, but I would love all of the farmers and the National Farmers Union to be, and, and all everybody else to be trained. So if a neighbor comes to you and says, I need to talk, you don't, you know, you know how to reply because people, I think, want to say the right thing. We're just scared about not saying it. And the other thing I would add is just, one, I had a board member at my last organization who would come to board meetings and say, yeah, so I have mental illness and I yeah. just want you to all know that. And it was, you know, now I'm able to say that and hopefully other people are. But the first time you hear it, you think, oh, really? You're going to. And then after you hear it a couple of times, you're like, yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, and you know what? It's interesting. And a light just went on for me. And that doesn't happen very often, Mara. So you made it happen. <laughs> you know, people people sometimes ask me why I talk about it. Um, and, and I think what you just said is if we if we if we talk about it, we get a certain freedom out of it. Because otherwise we're trying to hide it, we're we're ashamed of it when we shouldn't be. Yeah. And so when we open up and become vulnerable, it actually gives us increased freedom. You're right. You're absolutely right. It's like, wow. like trying to keep a secret that doesn't need to be kept. Exactly. And, you know, I think even she would say there are people that don't get it, but there are a lot of people who do. They might not say anything, but it's brewing around in the back of their head. And then 10 years later, they're on the, the Jerry Friesen show and Telling whoever's listening, yep, let's get through this. 
And, and the, the other piece I just wanted to reiterate what you talked about that article in the Globe and Mail, Mara, is, is, and I've gone through this myself, is when, when you see someone close to you, a friend, a colleague, a neighbor, whatever it may be, and you see that they're hurting, they're suffering, they're not doing well, there's a certain amount of fear in us, just like you said, that how are we going to say the right thing? Yeah. And and I think we're overthinking it because it doesn't have to be complicated. Uh, it's a matter of just like you said before, you know, how are you doing? Are you doing OK? And, and just provide that listening ear. It's not that we have to come up with any magical answers. Yeah. And I think that's the one thing that I mean, that the um, emergency, the mental health emergency first aid pro training um Maybe it includes that, and I just have forgotten it. But, but it, it, what I liked about this new kind of approach to training is it can it doesn't need to be applied to somebody who's just on the brink, right? Let's talk way before that. Exactly, absolutely, and, and I think you've kind of gone a little bit to, or we've gone where where the my kind of last question was going to be. See. This half hour goes by way too fast. <laughs> it's so interesting. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so just quickly again, then, uh, how, how can we, how can farmers and others living in rural communities be more supportive of their own mental health and the mental health of others in their communities? Well, I think there's a lot of, of great brochures out there and, you know, no more ag, or, um, you know, do more, sorry. Do more, do more ag. <laughs> Do more, no more. Sorry, <laughs> sorry to everyone and do more ag. I mean, lots of respect for that. And there, you know, there's so there's a lot of ideas out there. I would say that the the one that I don't see often enough that I would like to highlight is collective action. I mean, if we know things are broken and we sit around and we say, This is broken and I can't fix it, and I you know, I'm just one person and I know that, you know, there's huge issues of reasonably um, based Western alienation, for example, or isolation, or, you know, and thinking I can't fix that, but that's where the collective voice together, yeah. we can fix that. And we need people who have life experience to step up and say, we've been individualized now for 50 years and told you are an individual, uh, farmer, uh, business operator. Yes, that's true. But the power comes when we all get together and we say, we are going to fight for this. And even if we don't win, at least we've felt like we were alive and not just despairing. So I welcome anybody to join whatever group that is, if it's the National Farmers Union or your local board of, you know, whatever. Yeah. Absolutely. That's really important. Well, Tamara, we've reached the end of our time. Thank you very much for your insights. Um, thank you. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. What I should add is, is I've seen three thumbs up on my screen here. So people appreciated uh, the conversation we've had. I also see some comments and one of them is just says great dialogue. Um, so it's, it's awesome that the conversation we had, Mara. Thank you, everyone else, for joining us today. Uh, your insights, Mara, into mental health and wellness certainly have resonated with me. In fact, you switched a light on for me, which feels awesome. And so just to leave everybody with this thought is it's okay not to be okay. It's okay to have challenges, but it's also okay to reach out for help. So if you're struggling today, make sure you reach out and you talk about it. Also, please avail yourself of the many resources available in the Rural Mental Wellness Toolkit, which can be found at ruralmentalwellness.com. So till next time, stay safe and be well. And thanks again, Mara. Thank you.